Hi, my name is Matthew Short, and I'm the Digital Collections and Metadata Librarian at Northern Illinois University, and the Principal Investigator on the Johansson Project and the Street and Smith Project. Dime novels were one of the most popular forms of entertainment in the United States in the later half of the 19th century. This brief talk provides a working definition of the format and looks more closely at who wrote, published, and read these novels and why we should care about them today. In June 1860, Beadle and Adams published Melisca, the Indian Wife of the White Hunter by Mrs. Anna Stevens. This novel is the first in a series titled Beadle's Dime Novels, which ran for over 600 issues. Each number in the series contains a short novella, usually around 100 pages, which was sewn bound as a small booklet under distinctive orange paper covers. The stories were primarily frontier or historical romances, much of them written in imitation of James Fenimore Cooper. While most hardback fiction at the time might cost a dollar or more, equal to a laborer's wages for 12 hours of work, dime novels could be purchased for only 10 cents. The series was enormously successful, with each issue selling between 40 and 60,000 copies. A few issues of the series, such as Seth Jones, even sold in the hundreds of thousands, which was as good or better than most of the best-selling novels of the day. Success led to imitation by other publishers, and then the evolution of the format. What most people called dime novels were really the dime libraries or nickel weeklies, which began to appear a decade later in the mid-1870s. The earliest of these were also published by Beadle, including Beadle's New York Dime Library and Beadle's Half Dime Library. Like the dime novels before them, the dime libraries were mainly marketed to adults and often dealt with more adult topics and themes. The nickel libraries, however, were aimed at children, and especially boys between the ages of 8 and 16, who could spare a nickel more easily than they could spare a dime. The libraries are sometimes known by collectors as black and whites because they have illustrated black and white first pages and no wrappers. They vary in size from octavo to quarto, containing as few as 16 pages and as many as 64. Each library consists of one novella of around 20,000 words, but they sometimes also contain backup features like short stories or parts of serialized stories. By issuing their novels in a series with the occasional backup features, publishers sought to qualify for the lower second-class postage rate for periodicals, which was the real reason that publishers were able to sell dollar novels for a dime. The next major innovation was the Nickel Weekly, the earliest of which contained just 16 pages before 32 pages became the standard. Unlike the libraries, these novels had full-color wrappers, beginning with the first issue of Tip Top Weekly in 1890. Backup features also became much more common as dime novel publishers struggled to keep ahead of changing postal regulations. The post office was facing a huge deficit at the turn of the century and had been trying to reclassify dime novels as first-class mail for decades. They would eventually succeed in 1909 when Tip Top Weekly was reclassified as a book, which was one of the main contributing factors to the demise of the format. The final evolution of the dime novel is the thick book, which actually has much more in common with paperback novels, containing between 100 and 300 pages. While sometimes featuring original stories, more often these would be collections of previously published works. As many as three or four weeklies would be combined into a single thick book and presented as a new novel through the addition of connecting chapters. Street and Smith were the most prolific thick book publisher, issuing series like the Merriwell Library until 1933. No discussion of the dime novel would be complete without also mentioning story papers. These were newspapers that contained no news, but instead serialized stories, short stories, poetry, and editorial features. While the story paper originated in the 1830s, well before the dime novel, they were issued by the same publishers and often contained identical contents. Most of the early dime novels, libraries, and weeklies were simply reprints of stories that had been previously serialized in the story papers. Publishers would continue to rely on the contents of story papers to fill the back pages of their weeklies until the end of the dime novel era. The format was also extremely popular and would continue to be issued alongside the dime novel well into the 1910s and 1920s. So to review, the term dime novel encompasses many formats, beginning with the original pamphlets issued by Beadle and Adams in 1860, moving to the black and white libraries of the 70s and 80s, and then the color weeklies between 1890 and 1915. Finally, thick books close out the era, running until 1933. While there were many factors that contributed to the format's decline, the final nail in the coffin was film. For less than a dime, boys could see the same adventures they read about in dime novels acted out on the screen. But many dime novel series, characters, and authors would continue on into film, radio, pulp magazines, and even comic books. Separately are the story papers, which are closely intertwined with the dime novel, but have their own complicated history. There were dozens of publishers who put out dime novels, but only five who published them in significant quantities for any length of time. First is Beadle and Adams, who again are credited with originating the format. Although Erasmus Beadle founded the business, the consensus today is that Irwin deserves most of the credit for the dime novel itself. 
Unfortunately, Erasmus didn't agree, and with his business partner Robert Adams, forced his brother out of the firm. Beadle and Adams are also the subject of developer Johansson's bibliography, which provides a comprehensive history of the publisher. Next is George Monroe, a former employee of Beadle, who split off with Orinda Form Rival Company in 1863. George would publish Monroe's Tencent novels, An Imitation of Beadle, and The Fireside Companion, a story paper that introduced Old Sleuth, one of the dime novel's most popular characters. His longest running series was The Seaside Library, which primarily reprinted English and American novels and romance fiction. George's brother Norman also got into the dime novel publishing business and had a bad habit of stealing his brother's ideas. To his credit, though, he was one of the most tireless and effective advertisers and self-promoters of the 19th century. While other publishers were playing up the high moral tone of their offerings, Norman was proudly advertising that his story paper printed only the spiciest tales of divorce and sex. Perhaps his greatest claim to fame is the series Old Cap Collier Library, which is the first periodical dedicated entirely to detective fiction. Norman entered into partnership with Frank Tausey in 1873, who split off to form his own rival company three years later. Tausey would end up outdoing many other publishers when it came to printing sensational subject matter, and was the first to target young boys specifically with his series Boys of New York. This paper featured the exploits of inventors Frank Reed and Jack Wright, who were some of the earliest science fiction heroes. And finally, there's Street and Smith, who was the only publisher to survive the dime novel era, transitioning into pulp magazines and comics. They survived in part by buying up the rights to all of their former competitors and incorporating them into their own series. That said, Street and Smith were hugely successful in their own right, responsible for publishing stories about arguably the most popular characters in 19th century American fiction. The detective Nick Carter, the heroes of track and field Frank and Dick Merriwell, and the frontiersman Buffalo Bill. The publishing of cheap fiction was sometimes an ugly business. When the Monroe brothers weren't busy suing one another, they were busy suing Beadle, Tausey, or Street and Smith. In fact, the stories about the disagreements between the five publishers are at least as entertaining as the novels they published, involving the same proportion of family drama and betrayal. So who wrote dime novels? Prior to the 1850s, most popular fiction in the United States was pirated from Europe. The mysteries of Eugene Sue were probably the most popular, as is the work of Charles Dickens. Dime novel publishers would continue to reprint English and French novels well into the 20th century. This was extremely lucrative because there were no international copyright laws, so the only costs were for printing, binding, and distribution. The 1850s saw the rise of the first literary celebrities, figures like Eden Southworth, Sylvanus Cobb, and Meta Victor. These were mostly the invention of Robert Bonner, publisher of the New York Ledger, arguably the most successful story paper of all time, who realized that he could market a story based on name recognition alone. He would offer exclusive contracts in exchange for generous salaries and even benefits like paid time off. Some of the earliest dime novels, including the first by Mrs. Anna Stevens, were written by celebrated authors. When contracts began to expire, competition to sign away a rival publisher's authors drove up cost. This was good for the authors, but often less good for the publisher. They started to realize that it would be better if the author was their sole property. This trend really began with Old Sleuth, a name used by creator Harlan Page Halsey for his famous detective hero of the same name in stories that were published by George Monroe. When brother Norman Monroe introduced a very similar character named Young Sleuth, George sued and won. Even when Street and Smith lured Halsey away, George sued again and the courts found that he had a certain property right in the use of the phrase sleuth under the trademark laws, which uh, didn't go with its creator to a rival publisher. After this, dime novels were seldom attributed to real-world people, but instead to house names that would be owned by the publisher. Although the popular conception is that dime novels are only read by children, we know that in the beginning they were popular with all readers, young and old, wealthy and poor, male and female. Reflecting this diversity, publishers would often refer to their readers as the unknown public, the great people, and the million. The widespread popularity of the format has been attributed to a number of factors like rising literacy rates, printing press improvements, and better distribution via the railroads. But it also has a lot to do with the fact that dime novels were cheap, certainly much cheaper than most of the fiction that was available before the Civil War. By the 1870s, publishers began to target particular audiences as their marketing tactics evolved. For example, there were romance series like Beatles Fireside Library, which were aimed primarily at young women. But some of these efforts were more successful than others, with the general readership beginning to shift dramatically towards the end of the century. Publishers would focus most of their efforts on adolescent boys, with series about cowboys, detectives, inventors, and sports heroes making up the vast majority of what was published. Series for adults and girls still existed, like My Queen, but were not as common. 
Like most forms of popular entertainment consumed by children, dime novels were often the subject of controversy and a target for reformers and critics, most notably Anthony Comstock. Comstock was a United States Postal Inspector and longtime secretary of the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice. In his Traps for the Young, published in 1883, he argues that dime novels and story papers lead to crime as adolescent readers act out the behaviors they see modeled in the stories they read. You can see an illustration of this argument in the book's frontispiece, which shows boys buying story papers like Satan's Snare, then committing acts of vandalism and violence. Comstock would famously send Frank Tausey to the tombs for publishing Eugene Sue novel, arrest numerous news dealers, and reportedly burn thousands of dime novels and story papers in his moral crusade. While this campaign against the dime novels was short-lived, it did influence the public's perception of the format. Dime novel became a pejorative term and one associated primarily with books for undiscriminating and often wayward children. At any rate, it's primarily because dime novels were read by such a wide range of people that we're still interested in them today. While they may be lacking in substance and style, studying the format provides insight into what a diverse group of Americans were thinking and feeling at the end of the 19th century. Perhaps at the top of this list of topics is race and ethnicity. Our opinions on these subjects have thankfully evolved since the dime novel era, but the dime novel is one place for social and cultural historians to study this evolution. Dime novels are more racially diverse than most people expect, with Native American, Black, and Chinese characters appearing most frequently. These depictions are seldom very positive, although that doesn't mean they're not complex. And one thing that surprises students is how often ethnic minorities like Italians and Irish are also the target of exploitation and ridicule. Dime novels are also fertile grounds for understanding popular conceptions of gender and sexuality. Western heroes like Denver Dahl and Calamity Jane broke long established gender norms, not only in their appearance, but in their behavior. They resisted marriage, operated their own businesses, solved crimes, and fought alongside their male companions. Many researchers have been interested in trying to understand what that means in the larger context of American literature and culture, and especially in the context of the Western genre. Detective fiction is also full of gender transgressions, especially through the use of disguise and secret identities. Nick Carter seems to face off with a new femme fatale in every other issue, including pirate queens, Amazon queens, hobo queens, as well as thieves and even serial killers. While far from being positive depictions, these villains often have more agencies than the damsels usually do. Another common archetype is the dude or sport, like Violet Vane and Disco Dan, who are featured in a number of novels as recurring characters. These are impeccably well-dressed men who usually travel together in pairs and are rarely married until the conclusion of their adventures. The subtext in these stories is hardly very subtle. While we haven't yet encountered any dudes who are explicitly homosexual, we have found one novel about a lesbian pirate, the eponymous Captain Volcano, and another about a same-sex marriage between two women. Almost every major social, political, and cultural development of the late 19th century is also explored somewhere in a dime novel. Some of the earliest, for example, were written before or during the Civil War. In the back pocket of every Union soldier, supposedly, was the abolition novel Mom Guinea, which is told from the perspective of enslaved peoples in Louisiana. There are also series like Blue and Gray Weekly, which was written 40 years after the Civil War and is part of a still ongoing reunification effort. The series is about two friends separated by circumstances onto opposite sides of the conflict, each issue of which alternates between Union and Confederate perspectives. There are also novels about strikes, unions, and the labor movement, as well as temperance novels, which become increasingly common leading up to prohibition. This makes the dime novel a great place for studying popular perspectives on these monumental events and movements. Dime novels are also of interest to those studying the evolution of genre, many of which have the origins of the dime novel format. Perhaps no genre is more closely associated with the dime novel than the Western. Long before Zane Grey, dime novels had written thousands of stories about Deadwood Dick, Buffalo Bill, and Jesse James. In the 1860s and 70s, these westerns were the most popular and most common dime novel genre. Eventually, however, cowboys gave way to urban detectives like Nick Carter, Old Sleuth, and Old King Brady. In fact, the first detective novel published in the U.S. is a dime novel, The Dead Letter by Mrs. Meta Victor. There are also many genres that have all but disappeared today, including railroad fiction and circus fiction. Perhaps most interesting of all are the genre mashups, usually detective fiction paired with some other genre. While most genres of popular fiction can trace their prehistory even earlier than the dime novel, many of the plot devices, characters, and tropes that have become so common today were first solidified in the format. 
Despite having so much potential, relatively little scholarship has been written about the dime novel, at least when compared to other formats of popular fiction like comic books, films, or even the pulp magazines. This is primarily a problem of access. Because dime novels are considered ephemeral, they were generally ignored by libraries and seldom treated with a great deal of reverence by readers. Unlike cloth-bound books, which might be cherished for years, dime novels were left behind on the train, used to line chicken coops, or reduced to tatters from so many successive readings. Because they were printed under paper covers, often with the cheapest and most acidic paper available, what dime novels did survive are today rapidly disintegrating. They exist almost solely because of passionate collectors who saw the value of these materials when cultural institutions did not. The problem is that there are only a handful of publicly available collections, limiting who has access to this important part of American history and culture. The Johansson Project and the Street and Smith Project seek to digitize these holdings and make them more widely available online, both to preserve these materials before they're gone and so that anyone with an internet connection can study the format.